Well, um, first time, uh, my, it's my first time to Toronto, so obviously my first time to the, to, to the user group. Uh, thanks for having me here. Uh, we are actually coming out of a, a whole day, like an entire day of uh, uh, spring stuff, a uh, spring conference at the Pivotal office today. So we've already had quite a day of uh, 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 presentations. And uh, this is an opportunity for me to uh, um, present in this format. Uh, it's actually a uh, very up-to-date presentation on uh, Spring Framework 5 in the middle of its milestone phase. Uh, I am literally going to talk about uh, the state of the art, basically as of late last week. Uh, 5.0 M2, as we released it last week, uh, with a couple of um, new things, uh, very, well, new efforts of ours, uh, making, uh, making it to the public for the first time. Well, a uh, couple of words on, on, on myself. Uh, my name is Jürgen. I uh, uh, serve as the Spring Framework project lead, uh, as in leading the open source project on GitHub. Everything under the Spring Dash Framework GitHub uh, project is uh, basically my, uh, under, under my umbrella. I've been doing this ever since the inception of the project. I've co-founded the Spring Framework project back in 2003, um, serving basically in the same position ever since with various sites responsibilities, but I've never given up uh, the uh, uh, project lead position. Uh, like literally every single spring framework release ever since 0.9 uh, was signed off uh, by myself. I'm a little bit of a control freak in terms of release management and uh, I guess in general. But anyway, <laughs> so spring framework 5 is uh, the uh, major generation that we're currently preparing. Uh, but before we dive into five and before I give you a couple of a little bit of insight into uh, the themes behind five um, The state of the art is actually for the three and that's worth talking about just very briefly in its own right um, Because that's released in June a couple of months ago. It's actually uh, the uh, last feature release in 4.x It's a kind of wrap-up of some of the uh, spring framework four themes in the Spring Framework 4 line, that this was primarily refinements to the annotation-based component model. The uh, annotation-based story is long running. I mean, we started it back in 1.2, I guess, uh, really brought it to the current level, uh, uh, current extent in Spring Framework 3. And in 4, there have been many, many, many refinements to the model. I've given a dedicated presentation on this uh, this afternoon. Uh, but just to summarize, the dependency injection refinements and the MVC refinements in Spring Framework 4.3 are very significant. Um, we would usually just do them in, in 5.0. Uh, but we decided to bring them forward to Spring Framework 4, to the, uh, to the 4 generation, because the, it was simply easy enough. Um, sometimes we don't really um, uh, well follow traditional um, traditional versioning as much as you would, uh, would think we do. So Spring Framework 5 to us is a baseline. We really raised the baseline, Java 8 plus, and we'll be talking about it. 4.3 preserves the uh, Spring Framework 4 system requirements. So it still runs on JDK 6 plus, on even Tomcat 6, on WebSphere 7, so the 2.5 plus basically. And uh, it's uh, just for us a perfect opportunity to wrap up uh, the focus of the past few years uh, it's annotation-based configuration, annotation-based uh, uh, dependency injection, all those variants. And uh, our annotation story with its composability, building custom annotations, using custom annotations in your components, meta annotating them with framework annotations. All, all of that is basically brought to its uh, final extent in the Spring Framework 4 line everything that we really meant to do in that space, in that model, is, is in there right now. And this is a production release. We are in 4.3.3 at the moment. So uh, uh, it's, it's available right now in basically all production supported Java environments out there. We, that's also the reason why we brought some of those refinements forward because uh, we make them immediately accessible, immediately usable in production environments right now. And in particular, uh, JDK 6.7 still so some of the refinements in there is, for example, you don't have to declare uh, at auto-wired on a single constructor anymore. 
or um, we have a, an object provider model, flexible programmatic access to other beans in the context. Uh, quite a few facilities that really bring some of the injection model to a, to a different level. Um, and already starting a few, uh, a, a few of the efforts that we're also going to follow along in Spring Framework 5. Um, so th this is basically the state of the art. Um, this is also up for an extended support life. The, what we mean by extended support life is this final feature generation in each major branch um, is usually supported for some years to come. So this one is up for, for support at least until 2019. Uh, a little bit like the, well, actually very much like uh, Spring Framework 3.2 right now. So Spring Framework 3.2 is like in 3.2.17 right now, already extended support life since 2012. Uh, end of life actually at the end of this year. Uh, but this is similar in parallel to the Spring Framework 5 line with 5.0, 5.1 uh, certainly coming. Uh, this just receives an extended maintenance phase a couple of years. Uh, which is particularly important for the system requirements. So if, you're, if you can't use Spring 5 because of the system requirements, this is the generation to use for some years to come. So to contrast it with 5, um, the baseline is actually radically raised for our purposes. I mean, we're generally rather conservative in raising the baseline, but this one is actually as aggressive as it can be at this point. It's JDK 8 plus. Uh, it's actually, in some cases, even served at 3.1+. Um, it's basically a Java E7 baseline and a JDK 8 baseline, the latest generation of what's available there. So there's no requirement to use JDK9? There is no requirement to? To use JDK9. No. <laughs> um, we'll get to that. Uh, but no, no. Uh, we, are, we are generally pragmatically focused on the mainstream JDK generation out there, and that certainly is 8. Uh, JDK9 is a key topic, and we'll get to that. Uh, but frankly, this is going to be used with JDK 8 for some years to come. We know that JDK upgrades take a while to make it into production environments. So the, uh, um, the baseline itself has a few interesting things in there. JUnit 5 hiding there. Uh, this is actually, to some degree, Pivotal sponsored. Um, we have a uh, committer that uh, who's part of the core framework team, also a core committer on JUnit 5. So our testing story is also upgraded to the overdue <laughs> JUnit revision that's coming in JUnit 5 here. Um, right, and our GA target is early next year, March 2017, which is not coincidentally the original JDK9 GA target. We meant to follow along with JDK9, uh, but JDK9, as we've just heard, uh, got delayed. It's uh, only going to be released in July 2017, at the earliest, I would add. <laughs> um, we're, so um, we're going to revisit JDK9, but uh, our plan is to hang on to our March 2017 target, uh, even if that means that we need to release our JDK9 support ahead of time, kind of early JDK9 support before JDK9 goes GA. So um, in terms of themes, uh, it's basically infrastructure <coughs> themes. Spring Framework 5 is very infrastructure oriented. So not programming model refinements as much, more infrastructural. Uh, there's a JDK 9 theme, and I'm going to, go to, to basically guide you through all three of them. There's an HTTP 2 theme. Um, I'm saying servlet 4 here. It's kind of connected to servlet 4, uh, but I would actually invert <laughs> the arrangement here. We are more focused on HTTP 2 than on servlet 4. And it's reactive architectures, um, reactive programming, uh, bringing a reactive web stack into the Spring ecosystem. So before we dive into the themes, just uh, a, quick, uh, a quick little, a, a little bit of insight into what we do um, uh, when we raise the core container to a new major generation. Um, I've already hinted at some of those things having, having been sort of backported into 4.3. Um, the differentiation is to some degree um, tied to the baseline. Right? In Spring Framework 5, we have a JDK 8 baseline. We can finally do things we are unable to do in uh, Spring Framework 4, uh, like using Java 8 default methods in our own interfaces. Um, 
having hard declarations for Java 8 API types in our core interfaces, classes, constructors. So uh, if you look at the Bean Factory interface, at JDBC template, at uh, REST template, for example, all of those have to remain JDK 6 compatible at this point, at least in terms of the public surface. But as of Spring Framework 5, we can finally use uh, Java 8 API types and Java 8 language um, elements even in those um, core contracts and those uh, core APIs, traditional APIs in the Spring code base. That's already done. So as of 5.0.1, back in July, we've already done a revision of the entire code base. Uh, and this, this is 99% complete. Uh, we have a couple of other ongoing themes that we are only doing in 5.0, like the uh, uh, component index is brand new, released last week. Um, basically, facilities that allow for bootstrapping a, uh, a Spring application or a, a Spring-based service deployment unit um, in a more efficient way. In particular, in particular, repeated bootstrapping of the same unmodified deployment unit. You can guess that that's a little bit targeted towards cloud environments, towards a microservice architecture, where some of the uh, uh, service instances would be just fired up and taken down based on current demand, based on, on current uh, scaling decisions. So that's an M2, and there's uh, uh, a third one actually up uh, for, for November, which is um, an, an even stronger focus on programmatic facilities for registering beans and retrieving beans in a programmatic fashion. Basically, alternatives to annotation-based injection points and, and annotation-based factory methods in particular. Again, we are JDK 8-based, so we, we can finally rely on the Java Util function packages. We can have uh, facilities that support the uh, uh, Java Util suppliers, uh, other core functional interfaces that made it into JDK 8. Um, this is partially motivated uh, uh, by avoiding uh, reflection as well, so not just uh, programmatic alternatives to annotations, but also alternatives to using reflection. So um, as a kind of working uh, goal, right, as, a, as an extreme goal that we're trying to, to, uh, uh, to reach, you should be able to bootstrap a reasonably uh, complete Spring application without any use of reflection on startup. Um, not even dispatching to factory methods or dispatching to constructors. Uh, and there is a couple of ways of doing this, more functionally composed um, arrangements. Um, for any, since we, we heard uh, Scala before, we, we had some variant uh, of this even for Scala with a Scala functional application context. This is partially the motivation behind this, but it's not Scala oriented here. It's Java 8 aligned. So um, in a very natural Java 8 uh, style um, model, configuring the core container, bootstrapping it and retrieving beans from it. So this is basically in the works. We are now at M2. so. Uh, um, I can only present what we have and uh, add a little, a little bit of uh, a forward looking, a little bit of a forward looking note here. All right. So this is the core container. We used the opportunity um, to, to kind of um, revise the core container in every major generation. Uh, but other than, other than, than uh, uh, these facilities motivated by the baseline, we uh, uh, work along three main themes. And that's JDK 9, HTTP 2, and the reactive architectures. So let's go through them one by one. Um, they are all mm, kind of connected, and uh, we, we'll see uh, where those connections are. So JDK 9, as mentioned, um, is actually not on its original target anymore. So we won't get it in March. We might get it in July. Um, I'm I'm closely in the loop on, on the Jigsaw mailing list. I'm actually actively participating in, in uh, uh, the Jigsaw community effort here. Um, Jigsaw is, from my perspective, is in trouble. Uh, <laughs> it's, uh, the, the level of disagreement uh, between the stakeholders, um, the level of disagreement by major corporate sponsors is, uh, um, well, uh, it's at a level where I don't really see immediate consensus. Um, if uh, if the, JDK, the open JDK team just proceeds with Jigsaw as it is right now, 
we're going to be in a situation where large parts of the Java ecosystem are going to ignore Jigsaw to begin with. That's not necessarily such a bad thing. I mean, I'm completely pragmatic about that. Uh, Jigsaw may be the major feature area in JDK 9, but it's by no means the only feature area. There are so many good things coming in JDK 9 that it's going to be a worthwhile upgrade in any case. Um, just the runtime features, uh, the garbage collector enhancements, uh, compact strings, the um, reduced memory profile uh, that you will get against almost any typical web application on, um, on, on JDK 9 is going to be worth the upgrade. And JDK 9 has a class path mode. So we're going to talk about Jigsaw just a bit more, but don't forget there's going to be a class path mode. You can run JDK 9 with dash class path the way, you, the way you're using JDK 8 right now. Uh, and largely, uh, you're going to find the same arrangement. The JDK itself may not export some of its internals anymore, but uh, Depending on which frameworks and libraries you use, you may not care, or those frameworks have already done their job uh, in, in knowing what they have to do. But for application deployment, the class path is always an option. Uh, Jigsaw is an opt-in feature, fundamentally. You opt into configuring your JVM, your JDK 9 JVM, with the module path. So uh, a couple of... Uh, uh, couple of, of details on that in just a bit. And uh, another important feature area in JDK 9 is the, um, the general upgrade towards HTTP 2. They uh, finally include an out-of-the-box ALPN stack, uh, which is essentially required for any uh, HTTP 2 stack on top. And there's a new uh, HTTP client. Finally, no URL connection stuff anymore. Right? Uh, this 20-year-old strange API that was trying to abstract HTTP and FTP and whatever in, in an API that nobody was ever happy with um, is finally replaced by a dedicated HTTP client. And this dedicated client is HTTP-oriented, HTTP2-oriented, but not actually bound to it. Uh, so it's generally replacing um, uh, the URL connection arrangement before. So this is uh, also coming in JDK 9. Um, it's actually the main reason, or the, the most the most urgent reason why I would like to see it released. We'll get to that. So, just for Jigsaw, um, we are actively testing on JDK 9. We have a JDK 9 CI build. We do Jigsaw experiments. We have a couple of people in the community. Um, um, kind of using Spring as the, 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 the pr their primary choice of what they test Jigsaw against. So the current story, as of 5.0M2, um, is that the, um, uh, if you put the Spring framework jars onto the JDK 9 module path, opting into Jigsaw basically, um, if you use the latest uh, Jigsaw variant available there, you, you'll have a fine out-of-the-box experience. The Jigsaw defaults, the current Jigsaw defaults, work for Spring's assumptions. Um, if uh, the Spring jars can, uh, are put onto the module path, since we don't chip module descriptors in there, Jigsaw um, treats them as automatic modules. This is a, uh, actually a pretty, a pretty fine quality, a pretty fine feature in, in Jigsaw. You can just take regular jars, put them onto the module path, and uh, each of those jars is going to be wrapped by in what they call automatic module at runtime. You're not in class path mode, you're in module path mode. Each of the jars is a module then. But by default, such modules can see all the other modules on the module path. They have default access to the resources, like to metainf and other resources in those other jars. It's actually a pretty fine arrangement for uh, libraries and frameworks. From our perspective, it's actually almost perfect. Uh, the only thing we cannot do is restrict exports. An automatic jar automatically exports basically everything it has, all its public types, all its public uh, signatures, just like a regular jar. So uh, from an application perspective, and this is all that matters, from an application perspective, you may ship module descriptors in application jars. And those application jars may refer to spring modules that you put onto the module path. So if you take the Spring JDBC jar from Maven, basically, uh, from Maven Central, just put it into, onto your module path. There are default rules for the uh, module namespace. 
it's basically following the Maven Central naming conventions, but in, instead of dashes, you have dots. So it's like spring.jdbc by default for a spring dash JDBC jar file. Um, and you can refer to it by just declaring require spring.jdbc in your module descriptor, um, making Jigsaw aware of uh, making that uh, specifically declared connection to the other module. Um, it's actually irrelevant from, from an application perspective whether we ship module descriptors or whether we are automatic modules. It doesn't make a difference. It's equally usable in uh, application level module infos. So those module-infos are basically like package-info. Those are Java source artifacts. They are being compiled. Um, this structural information makes it into the jar file, basically as a special kind of class file. And the runtime, the JVM, has uh, um, formal structural information about your module declarations. So instead of just, uh, just a conceptual module, you actually have a runtime representation of your module boundaries and your module uh, interdependencies. That's generally a good idea. I mean, Jigsaw does, from my perspective, does many things right F in terms of uh, uh, focusing on, on, on the essentials of a module system. Unfortunately, um, many stakeholders out there wanted to do more. Some wanted to do less. Um, and there's, there, are arguments about, um, there are arguments about the defaults. The hardest part about in, in a module system is, uh, is the common case. Well, basically, you have to agree what the 80% case is. And there's no proper agreement on that yet. So whether you, is, for example, this kind of descriptor, does this mean that there are no public types exported or that everything's exported by default uh, in that module? There are arguments about this still. And uh, there shouldn't be. I mean, we're now in almost in October. Uh, they intended to release this in March. I mean, uh, at some point, those design discussions will have to end uh, for us to get JDK 9 actually released. All right, but this is the state of the art. Um, so uh, from a spring perspective, we had to do a little bit of fine tuning. Uh, the fine tuning is even in Folder 3, actually, <laughs> um, for Spring to run fine on JDK 9. And we have a CI build, so basically every night we uh, test against the latest JDK 9 build in order to learn whether we have any regressions. And I uh, have to add a word of caution here. Chixo is a moving target. Uh, the defaults may change. Currently, it all works fine for Spring's purposes. No guarantees whether that's still the case in three months' time. Uh, but uh, we, are, we make sure we are being heard. Uh, and we're not the only framework or the only library having those requirements. So basically, if it works for quite a few of the other libraries out there, like for Hibernate or uh, uh, then it also works for us, essentially. We need reflective access. We need to find class path resources. As long as those things uh, remain, we, uh, we are in a good position. But it's an, uh, it, it's an opt-in model, right? You can also have a perfectly fine spring experience with class path mode on JDK 9. All right, kind of connected because uh, JDK 9 actually ships an APN stack for HTTP 2. Uh, we have a general HTTP 2 theme. And um, I just need to make my usual plug for HTTP 2 here. If there is anything out there that's really worth picking up, then it's gen general industry-wide protocols such as HTTP2. So as a, as, a, as a Java community, we may have many things that we cook up within the Java ecosystem. But more important than that, there are industry standards, like actual industry standards, not language-specific uh, standards out there, where uh, we really need to catch up with. Uh, HTTP2. Uh, it's the first revision, the first proper revision of uh, the most important communication protocol we're using. And it, HTTP, uh, HTTP 1.1 actually dates back to 96. It's 20 years old. So it's really overdue that we have a, uh, uh, a revised version of that protocol. And uh, there's qu quite a bit of goodness in there. I mean, we may not agree with everything, and nobody really understands how the pushing of resources is supposed to be used in practice. But let's forget about that. Uh, the binary protocol is, is the binary representation on the wire is a big step forward. Um, the, uh, the upgraded uh, uh, TLS stack is worth it alone. Connection multiplexing, finally. 
um, we, it, uh, we get rid of this silly arrangement with how many connections is a browser allowed to have to a server, multiplexing over the same connection, keeping connections open uh, without any, any, any kind of uh, impact is, is a great idea. Headers compression, sending a bunch of texture headers once to the server, assigning like a symbolic reference to it, and follow-up requests just say, I mean the same headers as before, not sending this bunch again and having the same bunch parsed again, a great step forward. So uh, we need this. We need basically all of this. And I don't care for push, but the rest alone is worth it. Right? Um, browsers did their job. We have, well, any, any of the browsers, right? Chrome, Firefox, Edge, Safari. They are all capable of talking HTTP2. The infrastructure is largely out there, as far as I'm aware. Um, however, the servers usually reject HTTP2, right? We, in particular in Java land, we almost exclusively have servers out there uh, just speaking HTTP 1.1. So we are the one kind of prevent, preventing, uh, we are part of <laughs> the reason why, uh, why HTTP 2 is not as uh, uh, commonly used as it should be. So making servers capable of speaking HTTP 2 is, a, um, is unfortunately a non-trivial effort. There's, serv there's the servlet for the DOS specification in the works for more than three years. Actually, nothing happened in the past 12 months anyway. But uh, servlet for the DO uh, is meant to enforce HTTP2 support in servlet containers. And it, we really need to get there. This needs to be enforced. Uh, at the same time, let's not wait for servlet 4. Let's not use it as an excuse for not doing it right now. And unfortunately, um, quite a few stakeholders in the industry do exactly that, right? They, they point to Servlet 4 and they, they kind of claim that they have to wait for Servlet 4 in order to deliver an HTTP2 story. That's just not true. Um, as proven by the latest versions of Tomcat Jetty, Undertow, Tomcat 8.5, for example, this intermediate generation of Tomcat, um, is essentially a, a Tomcat 8 upgrade with an HTTP2 capability still Servlet 3.1 based because they can't release Tomcat 9 before Servlet 4 goes final. They want to be a Servlet 4 container. So they decided to do Tomcat 8.5 in between. Uh, Jetty was actually one of the earliest uh, uh, delivering an HTTP2 stack. And Undertow, the web server underneath Wildfly, uh, a JBoss project, um, is also pretty, pretty far along. So configuring those, even if it takes a little bit of dancing around because you may need to modify your JDK installation, kind of getting an LPM provider um, into, your, uh, into the uh, uh, JVM endorsed libraries, um, kind of it may not be super trivial, but it's doable uh, as proven by those server containers. So by all means, let's use them. They are available right now for a couple of months already. We can do HTTP2 right now in 2016 if we want to, and we really should want to. So from a Spring Framework perspective, um, Servlet 4, of course, is a little bit too far out. Um, at Java 1, they've announced that they are going to target Java E8 and Servlet 4 in particular for September next year, right in time for Java 1 next year. I personally, um, assume that that's actually going to happen. I mean, that's more than four years after Java E7. So if it's not happening, then they can just forget about it and, and, and stop pretending. Uh, so uh, they will deliver. It is going to happen uh, in, in mid to September 2017. In as far as my understanding goes uh, from, from this year's Java 1, and I've followed very closely and uh, checked a few, um, a few people in the know, um, Java E8 is going to be scaled down to essentially deliver Servlet 4, to deliver Bean Validation 2, um, JAXRS 2.1, not a JSON B, so a JSON binding, a sort of JSON equivalent, not much more than that. There's not going to be a JMS 2.1. They basically canceled the JMS 2.1 effort. Uh, and there's not going to be an MVC specification in that umbrella either. So that's the current plan as presented, as Oracle presented it uh, at Java 1 anyway. Uh, personally, I, I, I hope that we will get the fundamental updates in Servlet 4. Uh, Bean Validation 2 is, is, is entirely worthwhile. Checks RS 2.1 looks fine as well. 
All right, but uh, from a spring perspective, our plan is to pick up spring, uh, to pick up Servlet 4 in spring framework 5.1. We intend to release 5.0 in March, 5.1 end of next year. Uh, there will definitely be Servlet 4 and uh, Tomcat 9 GA, hopefully, um, and uh, other such um, providers by end of next year. So we'll pick up the official Servlet 4 story then. Up until then, the only option that we have is to support the native HTTP2 stack in Tomcat JD under Tow Co. All right. So um, in HTTP2, it's a, uh, it's a lot about efficient use of our networking infrastructure out there. It's basically instead of just sending uh, the, the, the same uh, um, the same wordy text over the wire uh, again and again, we have optimized representations. Um, HTTP2 is very much about the efficiency of communication, the efficient use of networking resources. Somewhat related, we have a reactive focus. Um, because reactive programming, and in particular reactive streams, are about efficient use of I.O. stacks, efficient use of, of I.O. Um, and to some degree also about CPU resources. Um, so our reactive focus is the most important um, story we have uh, that really affects the programming model. Because reactive programming doesn't come for free. Reactive programming really requires us to re-architect our entire web stacks, our entire, uh, well, our entire uh, data store uh, communication. Um, it's a different way of uh, setting up the uh, I.O. processing stack in an application. This is also quite, quite a, a difference in Springland, of course. I mean, uh, traditionally, Spring, uh, a Spring web application is a servlet-based web application um, having some async processing facilities available, but essentially being servlet-bound. The request comes in, you process the request within a thread that you exclusively own for the duration of that request. Uh, you write out to the response, and then you return, and only then you, re you, you uh, basically free the thread, let the thread go back to the uh, thread pool in the servlet container. Uh, with a reactive web stack, we have to turn that completely around. And um, just to give you a little bit of background on where we're coming from here. This has been in the works for almost two years, or well, more than one and a half years. Um, and we've, we've been following the um, reactive efforts in Java Lane very closely. Uh, Rx Java a couple of years ago, uh, the emergence of the reactive manifesto, the declaration of, of of qualities of characteristics that we mean to achieve in a reactive architecture. Um, so the reactive manifesto, I mean, it's obviously a, um, a bunch of, uh, uh, of terms essentially, just, but it's, it, it, it basically get, gets it right. We want, um, we want a stack, we want applications, services that behave very consistently, very predictable, uh, very stable, even under high load. We basically want responsiveness even in high load situations. We want resiliency in the sense of, uh, um, well, the, the server not going down just because uh, um, um, some target service that uh, some, some, some requests wait on uh, doesn't respond at the moment. And uh, the uh, reactive manifesto uh, kind of motivated an initiative called reactive streams, kind of the next step that the uh, stakeholders took was to define the reactive streams specification. Reactive streams really isn't that much, that much of a specification. It's basically a, an arrangement of uh, a couple of interfaces, very minimal, just defining um, rules for interaction between publishers and subscribers in a, in a processing arrangement, in a processing pipeline. This is it's actually quite minimal and it's quite low level. But in the end, it's exactly what was needed uh, for some of the stakeholders to kind of move forward from there. Um, as long as everybody agrees on the reactive streams arrangement, um, the uh, uh, ability to, to interact between different composition libraries, different data store drivers, different web stacks, uh, just really follows from there. And the uh, reactive streams is uh, actually repackaged into JDK9. So we've got a connection back to JDK9 here. Uh, in JDK9, there's Java Util Concurrent Flow, which is basically kind of a, uh, just a, a holder with uh, the interfaces nested inside that type. 
Those are the exact same interfaces, just repackaged. Uh, the uh, open source version of those interfaces is in org.reactive streams. So um, um, available as an open source project. Uh, Reactive Streams is actually uh, an initiative where lots of uh, um, stakeholders collaborated. So the Lightband, Pivotal, uh, um, the RH Java guys, there were many people collaborating, agreeing on those, those contracts. So um, in terms of our own efforts, um, we are kind of motivated by RH Java in many ways. Uh, RxJava is an important inspiration. We are closely collaborating with uh, the people working on RxJava today. But we have our own initiative, Project Reactor. Recently, having seen its 3.0 GA release, uh, Reactor is a kind of RxJava revisited on JDK 8 Plus and Reactive Streams based from day one onwards. Because RxJava predates Reactive Streams and RxJava is JDK 6 based. Even RxJava 2 is JDK 6 based because they wanna still want to run on Android. And RxJava comes from a different background. The uh, Reactive X, um, uh, Reactive X was initially motivated by more like user interface arrangements. Um, some of the terminology and um, uh, some of the assumptions there uh, make most sense in that context. It hasn't really been designed for server side use, for server side stacks which React is, is uh, essentially focusing on. So uh, for those of you aware of RxJava, I mean, RxJava has the central observable type. Any RxJava people in here? So uh, RxJava observable is kind of the uh, uh, central API for, uh, well, composing reactive processing, uh, chains re reactive processing pipelines. The direct equivalent in Reactor is Flux. And Mono is a sort of, a sort of single, completable, not quite, but sort of, right? So there are two key types in Reactor, Flux and Mono. Essentially, it's a sort of RxJava revisited uh, in, a, in a more, in a tighter uh, fashion and JDK 8 plus based with the Java Util function interfaces and everything available. All right, and it's, uh, React is a Pivotal sponsored project, but not just Pivotal sponsored. Uh, uh, David Carnock from RxJava is actually involved in Reactor. He's a committer on Reactor, uh, and he actually recommends the use of Reactor. Right? Basically, David says, if you're on JDK 8 Plus and you're building server-side applications, go to Reactor, use Reactor 3, uh, because RxJava is not really uh, your ideal choice in that scenario. Does uh, Reactor 3 support all the Rx operators? Uh, it's very much aligned with the operators known, of, known from Observable. So if you use Flux or Mono, you'll find plenty of the common operators there. They, ex they even explicitly focused on alignment, right? So they, they kind of collaborate on a very similar feel. Uh, it doesn't mean that every single variant is available, but essentially everything you would commonly use uh, is available there. So Re Re Reactor is our choice for uh, the engine underneath. In Spring Framework 5's reactive stack, we use Reactor internally. Re uh, we build our networking stack on Reactor. We also suggest the use of the Reactor API types in signatures. We'll get to that. So just a, a quick diagram for the reactive streams interaction that Reactor is based on, and that's essential to the problem we're trying to solve. Um, a, the idea is that you have a publisher and a subscriber agreeing on a subscription where the uh, subscriber can request further elements to be published to the subscriber whenever it's available to actually process them. It's basically about flow control. Publishers and subscribers interacting with each other uh, instead of just the publisher pumping out the data and not caring whether anybody is able to process them. You're trying to avoid blocking that way. You're trying to implement uh, this concept called back pressure where uh, the uh, uh, subscriber basically prevents the publisher from just pumping data uh, along uh, unless it's actually able to process them any further. Just imagine if the subscriber is about to write to a HTTP response. It can only really do so if uh, the HTTP stack can actually uh, uh, send further, further uh, frames along. Right, so that's reactive streams. It's actually pretty low level. In general, at the application level, you don't have to care for this. Um, if, if the participating components underneath uh, understand uh, reactive streams, they just naturally interact with each other. The only thing you have to do is to compose, the only thing, right? <laughs> it's, it's, it's to compose a reactive processing pipeline 
that actually uh, allows for doing this underneath the covers. It's a non-trivial effort, but I'm going to give you a little bit of insight into what this can look like in Spring. So in Spring Framework 5, we have uh, several layers of reactive support, uh, but the most important one is uh, the reactive endpoint model for web endpoints. This is kind of uh, Spring MVC-like, using the same stylistic elements. It's, you can have annotated controllers with request mappings, but instead of running on a server container, running on a reactive engine underneath. So uh, let's, let's explain that uh, on, the, on the diagram again. So what you traditionally know in Springland is on the left hand side. You have a servlet container, a traditional servlet container, traditional servlet deployment like a WAR file, the servlet API uh, leaking through Spring MVC, Spring Servlet MVC being directly based on the servlet API. In Spring MVC, you can go as far as declaring a servlet request argument and Spring is going to inject it for you. So you know you're running on the servlet API, you're using, you may use the servlet API, but you in particular work within servlet semantics, servlet invocation semantics. A Spring MVC handler method is being invoked, owns the thread, can uh, process the entire request, write the response, and only then return, like in any server-based application. The uh, add control and add request mapping model sits on top of the servlet st stack traditionally. So that's kind of what you traditionally have in Spring, uh, like Spring 4.3, for example. And it's still there in Spring 5, actually a key point. None of this servlet-based Spring MVC model is going away. It's, uh, we even evolve it. it. There's an evolution of this model available in Spring 5, and I expect this to be very commonly used because many applications are perfectly happy being coded against uh, a servlet container, against a servlet model, running on an efficiently tuned servlet container, um, just delivering good enough results that way. That's great. But if you find yourself in a hotspot situation, in a situation where certain services tend to be overloaded, um, where you are I.O. bound and uh, uh, your th a significant number of your threads um, might be blocked uh, because they are waiting for, for other I.O. resources to return, um, then you might actually not be that happy on the servlet stack. This may be a problem that you only have in specific parts of your system in a microservices architecture, maybe just for specific services. Uh, but if you have it, uh, it may be a quite, uh, a quite demanding challenge. And this is exactly what we have this parallel stack for. There's a reactive web stack um, with a uh, kind of general reactive HTTP abstraction and the web reactive layer on top. This is basically the equivalent of Spring MVC up there. You can have reactive ad controllers with uh, uh, reactive request mappings on top. But this is not the only way of tapping into the reactive stack. We have a new vari a variant as well, which is uh, a programmatic router function arrangement. It's basically a uh, functional composition of routes and handlers running on the same stack. So there's, a co there's common infrastructure underneath and basically two different ways of uh, running application endpoints on that infrastructure. Right, and uh, at uh, the bottom, this can be adapted onto Netty. If you want the high, uh, basically the, the most efficient networking stack possible, then there is an obvious choice out there, and that's Netty. Uh, you can adapt it to Undertow Core, uh, which is without the Undertow servlet support, directly to Undertow Core. And you can adapt it to the servlet 3.1 uh, async I.O. model. So if you want to run it on Tomcat or Jetty, on an embedded Tomcat, embedded Jetty usually, uh, you can use the server 3.1 async uh, um, uh, I.O. model. We uh, adapt even the back pressure arrangement onto server 3.1 I.O. However, it's important um, to understand that server 3.1 is an implementation detail, an adaptation detail underneath. The servlet API does not leak through here. None of the higher levels are servlet based because they need to be adaptable to Netty and uh, other non-servlet containers underneath. Um, so that's a, a key difference here. Servlet API shines through basically to the top. Servlet is just an adaptation detail at the lowest level over here. So what does this look like for uh, at the application controller level? This is a simple sketch for what a reactive web controller may look like. 
at first glance, this looks like a Spring MVC controller, doesn't it, right? I mean, if you look a little bit closer, you find get mapping annotations that may be a little unusual, but that's a Spring 4.3 feature. That's a convenience variant of request mapping uh, pre-bound to uh, the get method. So that's actually still Spring MVC. Looking even closer, even more closely, at the signatures. Um, those signatures don't return just a user or a list of users, uh, which are then turned into like a JSON representation on the wire sent back to the, uh, to the caller. They actually return a mono of user and a flux of user. So they use reactor types in the signatures here. Like the get users method below apparently calls like a repository. There's a repository involved and the repository happens to return a flux of user. So what, what is this flux of user? Um, in all brevity, um, we are building a reactive processing pipeline here. So the repository returns a flux of user, which is basically uh, instructions, a chain, of, uh, a chain of callbacks for how to obtain a, a sequence of, uh, of user representations from a target data store. But at this point, none of it is actually retrieved. So we are not waiting for those, uh, for those, for the, uh, we're not waiting for the data store to actually uh, deliver the data to us. We just have instructions for how to um, access the data store and transform the results into a sequence of user objects. If we return this straight to the Spring web stack as a flux of user, the web stack understands what to do with it. It can actually, whenever it's ready to, to write the response, it subscribes to the flux and starts, um, basically triggers this processing arrangement um, in a reactive style. So only when data is actually available, we start pumping it in and writing it out. None of this is blocking. This is entirely, ideally, entirely non-blocking. Of course, the repository needs to be implemented in a corresponding style. Uh, if, if you just design your controllers that way and then start calling a blocking repository that uses JPA to, uh, to map half of the database into an object model in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a blocking call, you're not going to get much benefit, right? Um, so the uh, reactive stack really needs to be all the way through from the HTTP um, layer down to the uh, data store and back up. Th then and only then you're going to get the full game and then it's worth the pain because there is a little bit of pain involved. This looks reasonably straightforward because we essentially just delegate to a repository. This may be significantly more complex uh, in terms of processing arrangements. You need to build a, f a, a chain of functional callbacks. Um, you can't just uh, um, do traditional blocking calls. Uh, you shouldn't even do traditional iteration or the like. It is a different coding style. So uh, just for the flux and mono part here, uh, flux is basi basically a sequence of any number of users, like a, like a collection. Uh, mono is a specialized type uh, representing basically a single user element or none. So that's why mono is roughly equivalent to uh, the single type, except for that it's not bound to delivering a single type. It's, it's, it's a little bit like Java util optional even in, uh, in what it represents. All right, so this is uh, stylistically an annotated Spring Controller class. Looks like a Spring MVC controller actually reuses a lot of types. Add controller, the annotations here, get mapping, path variable, all of this stuff, these are the same annotations that you also declare in Spring MVC. We are reusing our common uh, design elements here. But it's not a controller that you can just uh, uh, dump onto a server container or onto a reactive container, uh, a reactive stack. You really code for the reactive stack here. <coughs> this is a reactive web controller. It's only meant to be run on the reactive web stack. Uh, it just stylistically uh, resembles a Spring MVC controller. That's our intention there. Dedicated controllers for the particular stack, uh, but a common style between them. So is Spring Data going to be like, reorganized to support this like, at release time, plus or minus? Uh, great question. Is Spring Data going to, uh, going to support this? Yes, it's already in the works. Um, even available in the snapshots already, I think so, but no milestone yet. So they, they have very concrete plans for this, where uh, uh, such a repository may be a Spring Data repository interface uh, with the flux and mono return types. Um, 
and uh, implemented for the uh, target data stores actually supporting reactive drivers. So for like uh, uh, Couchbase, uh, Mongo, Redis, I think. Uh, and they support uh, large Java types as well, and we do too. In the yeah, uh, that's actually a great point in its own right. Thanks, Ross. And the, uh, um, the arrangement here is reflective, right? We look at your signatures and do what your signatures suggest. So you can just go here. And if your target code, if your target reactive driver happens to return an RxJava observable, that's fine. Just carry it through. Change the declaration to observable of user, pass it on to the web stack. The web stack knows what to do with it because we have RxJava adapters kicking in automatically. Uh, this is in particular useful if you talk to third party code, if, you, if your code happens to delegate to third party code, which is RxJava based. But it's also, of course, an implementation choice that you may make uh, to choose RxJava for your composition arrangement. So yeah, in Spring Data Reactive, uh, the timeline is aligned with ours. So they intend to release in the first half of next year for sure, um, probably a month after Spring Framework 5 GA, I would expect, in time for Spring Boot 2, which is picking up all of those things in, in, in combination. Is Aerospace supporting? Uh, Aerospike, uh, I'm not really familiar with what, uh, Aerospike. What, what's Aerospike specifically? It's a key value pair of storage. Um, I'm pretty uh, sure at the moment they're doing non, they're doing whichever one has non-blocking async or reactive driver. Um, I don't even know is it supported in the regular like in the current user? Yeah. Yeah. So probably no, but. Um, but they, they, they'd, they'd be happy for that to happen as yeah. a community contribution for sure. Yeah, but, um, themselves might be but it's essentially, a, uh, there needs to be a, a, an, an async or ideally reactive uh, uh, drive API, client API to begin with. So. Yeah, we, we, th this, is, this is basically a, a problem that we cannot solve on our own. We are, uh, we are partially doing this now and talking about this now as a motivation for some of the other stakeholders to uh, kind of um, <clears throat> do their part, uh, as a motivation for some of the data store companies to finally ship reactive drivers in a production fashion. Because some of them, they, they have some variants, but they are basically <coughs> all experimental. And we want them to be productized. And uh, uh, in for our Spring Data efforts here, if Spring Data ships actual support for concrete data stores, um, that's kind of a f an enforcement from our side um, for the companies behind Couchbase and Co to um, kind of move forward on their end as well. Does the non-blocking discussion have in Java one? Does that have any sort of it goes in the same direction. There's a, a Java 1 Oracle uh, presented a, a, a basically a prototype for an uh, asynchronous uh, relational database access. It's not actually JDBC based, um, but it's, that's what it is. It's a prototype. I mean, it's, it's a fine idea, and it would be a great complement for, for these kinds of architectures um, if you're talking to a relational database. But <sighs> the presentation at Java 1, at the, it was kind of pretty engaging to listen to it or to, to, to look at it and uh, at the uh, very end it said hmm JDK 10 maybe and that's basically when everything falls down and falls down again right sort of I don't want to wait for JDK 10 to get this right um, so we can expect to see it around the time I retire That's yeah it's uh, uh, I mean, it's fine if it makes it into JDK 10 proper at some point, as long as there's also a release of it uh, that's usable against uh, JDK 8 or 9. I would hope that's, uh, that's the outcome there. Um, the, uh, that API is not actually reactive in the sense of being based on, 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 on reactive API types, but it's at least um, based on, on completion stage, on completable future essentially, which is not completely ideal in particular for larger sequences of, um, uh, of uh, result data here. But it's, it's, it's a huge step forward over uh, standard JDBC, for sure. All right, so uh, uh, lots of pieces in the puzzle. This is basically our piece in the puzzle. And the underlying web stack, I mean, this is just the surface area, uh, the underlying reactive web stack. So this is one way of using that stack. We actually have to complete uh, the tour here, we have another variant of using the same stack. If the uh, 
<laughs> if Adib's laptop lets me, we've been talking about that particular example for too long. Yeah. Yeah. Count how many characters it is. Yeah. All right. All right. Thank you. Yeah, but that was a very long password. I, I couldn't count. All right. All right. So. So just have, have another quick look at this, right? This is Spring MVC style. Now, a very different variant of expressing the same processing logic and the same routing logic can be seen here. It's, it's a programmatic variant. Um, it's actually built on the same foundation, uh, but it's a dedicated uh, layer of functional interfaces being used here. You compose a router function. This, uh, the, the snippet here, this is Java 8 code. It looks like a domain-specific language, but it's, it's actually not, right? It's a, or, well, uh, it's kind of intentionally DSL-like, but it is Java 8 code. Uh, making heavy use of uh, lambdas in this case, but in particular also of static imports. So in case you're wondering, where does this route come from? Uh, or where does uh, from publisher come from? Uh, static imports, <laughs> uh, which you're not seeing here. There's a, like a router functions and request predicates static import. But it's essentially the same logic. The idea is that there is a, a functional arrangement, basically callback interfaces, a router function and handler function, and uh, factory methods that allow you to compose router functions and point to handler functions. So in this case, we're building a route to the, uh, this uh, user's ID path, and we attach a handler function to it. So whenever a matching request comes in, uh, this is the handler function to be invoked. And whenever a matching a request for this one comes in, this is the handler function to be involved. Modeling actually the same, the same web service, the same HTTP service as here. Um, so the implementation is largely analogous. We call this repository, <laughs> this fancy repository with its uh, uh, reactive return types. However, some things are a little more complicated, um, like path variable access here, right? Passing the path variable in. Um, since this is a, a functional interface. The request comes in into a handler function and the response is to be returned. Uh, you can't have a flexible signature with uh, custom parameters that you declare. You have to interact with the request. And if you want to do this in a functional style, you can just say request path variable, build a mono from it, but the path variable is a string by default. So you have to convert it to a long and then pass it onto repository find out by ID. Um, have a just, just a look at the use of the Java 8 language style here. It's not only the lambdas for the handler functions, it's also a couple of method references being used here. Um, if this looks vaguely familiar to collection streams, Java util collection streams, it intentionally is familiar, right? uh, intentionally analogous. This is basically the same style that you would code, uh, uh, code uh, uh, fi find the code for, uh, for Java util collection streams. It's uh, um, a little bit more straightforward down here. The uh, response building is, uh, this is the current API as in 5.0M2, so it it, it's still subject uh, to change. Uh, but uh, it's very explicit that we are taking a reactive streams publisher here because Mono and, Flu and Flux are reactive streams publisher implementations. You can pass it into the from publisher factory method, which creates a body inserter. And uh, this is the response basically a response status uh, okay, and uh, the body coming, the body to be built from this reactive streams publisher, and then returned from our handler function. So some of it is a little different in style, but essentially modeling the same, uh, the same domain, the same arrangement. This is with handler functions as lambdas. Um, I think it's pretty obvious that if you're trying to model more routes and more handler functions here, this gets a little convoluted, right? I mean, route, 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 and nested handler functions. And um, it works for two or three routes. But beyond that, I would prefer this arrangement here. Because using the very same, the very same uh, uh, layer of functional interfaces, but instead of nested lenders, using uh, method references even for the handler function. You, ha you end up building a route with basically one lines, uh, composing the, the, the actual uh, request predicates, and then binding it to a target method 
through a Java 8 method reference, those target methods need to follow, uh, as for any Java 8 method reference, they need to be compatible with the signature of the target interface. And the target interface is handler function. You can guess what handler function looks like. Request coming in, response going back. So this is actually pretty straightforward. Remember, this, these are Java 8 method references. There is, these are straight bindings. The Java compiler is going to uh, basically adapt this target method onto the uh, requested interface here. There is no, no reflection involved. And this is basically the same code that we had in the Lambda before. Right? So um, in that sense, straightforward. This is a little more scalable. You can have several delegates. You can bind to any number of methods. Even if you have 10 routes here, you would have 10 target methods, maybe over two or three delegates, or even the same delegate. And then you just bind that way. You need an instance of the delegate, of course, but that can be a spring managed bean or just um, an instance that you created up front. So this is, um, this is literally a week old. Uh, we just released it last week. And there's a blog post on, on spring.io slash blog uh, discussing the uh, uh, design motivation and the variance in, in more detail. Um, the um, idea is a, uh, um, a variant of using the reactive web stack without any use of annotations, without any use of uh, reflection even, and in particular at, at the lowest level, at the, at the most minimal level, without the use of a Spring application context. There's no Spring application context involved. You don't even need a core container. We are scaling this down to a sort of library variant uh, along the lines of JDBC template or the Spring JMS support. They are essentially libraries, can be used anywhere outside of uh, a Spring application context. This is at its lowest level uh, the same kind of arrangement. Of course, you can have, uh, you can delegate out to an application context, you can obtain the handlers from an application context, you can even set up the router functions uh, in an application context, but you don't need to. If you're building a microservice with a very minimal web surface, just two or three uh, routes to bind. This is a very straightforward way of getting started, of, of tapping into that web stack, of building such a uh, microservice arrangement. All right, so this is essentially uh, just a teaser for what we have here, um, different variants of tapping into the same reactive web stack. If you want to see more of this, um, spring.io slash blog, um, there are a couple of um, uh, related blog posts in the meantime telling, telling the full story, both about Reactor, uh, the choice of flux and monotypes, uh, their specific design, <coughs> and also about uh, the uh, annotated reactive controller style from back in July, a blog post from back in July, and about the functional endpoint style, a blog post from last Thursday. All right, uh, so this is basically basically it for, for today's little tour here. Uh, just summarizing that in Spring Framework 5.0, we are still on track for Q1, uh, Q1 GA target, targeting March. Uh, JDK, the JDK 8 baseline goes across the code base and is an enabler for so many things. But uh, in terms of infrastructure themes, we are focused on early JDK 9 support in the sense as outlined before that uh, as an application, you can choose to use Jigsaw. And also generally speaking, um, you can deploy a Spring Framework based application on JDK 9 and it just works out of the box uh, without any, any uh, uh, issues or, the, or any special setup necessary. We are in uh, the business of embracing HTTP 2. I mean, we're, we're trying to promote uh, the, the, the effort to some degree. This is not just our own effort. We have some HTTP 2 related efforts of our own because we build a reactive web client and we have other uh, specific efforts going on, but it's also about industry collaboration. We are in touch with the Tomcat team, the JD team, with other players in the industry, uh, just trying to sort out the HTTP2 story uh, so that uh, um, like for a Spring Boot arrangement in particular, you can have a nice out-of-the-box experience with uh, a Spring web application on Tomcat or JD uh, um, uh, and an HTTP2 enabled stack by default. In terms of uh, the uh, um, reactive story, we are focusing on reactive web controllers in the sense of annotated web controllers. We have this new functional web endpoint style where we are kind of uh, looking for feedback. We are really wondering um, what, people, uh, what people do with it, uh, whether that's considered useful or whether that's considered a, 
uh, just a bonus uh, and everybody's going to use the annotated controllers anyway. We're going to see. Um, the uh, embedded bootstrapping is kind of an ongoing theme. Uh, Spring Boot is very much, of course, in going in that direction. But we are generally a little more focused on, on building, well, microservices essentially, smaller units of deployment. Um, the idea behind reactive microservices, right? Hype term plus hype term is, uh, the, the, but the, the idea is from our perspective pretty concrete. We do not expect an entire system to be reactively coded. In uh, any real life arrangement, you're not going to get reactive benefits out of every corner of your system. Large parts of your system might be perfectly fine coded even, even in, in the coming years being running on a traditional server container coded in a traditional servlet style with Spring MVC applications as you know them, um, that's perfectly all right for many parts of your system for sure. In particular, more like uh, uh, information systems, maybe CRUD parts of the system where um, you're, you're aggressively caching the, uh, the data structures anyway where you're not reaching out to external data stores to begin with, heavily using HTTP caching itself maybe. Um, so it's a trade-off um, whether you even wh whether you even bother there with uh, uh, trying to introduce uh, reactive interaction, and it's very much bound to the target data stores. If you're doing traditional transactions, if you're talking to a, a traditional JDBC or JPA based uh, JPA accessible uh, uh, database, then uh, you're better off with the servlet model, to be frank. Right? Just that's the better trade-off. Uh, it's not worth the pain of, uh, of the stands of an extra thread pool trying to, to do the JPA access and then uh, uh, not blocking the original, um, the original networking thread. That's, uh, don't bother. But if in specific parts of your system <laughs> you have a data store with a reactive driver, um, you control the, react the, the web stack. You can choose to use Netty there, for example, in a, for particular services in your system. By all means, do it. Pardon? Yeah, if it of course, of course, it depends on. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it's a, a fair point. If uh, the microservices interact with each other uh, and need to shovel data between each other, then the reactive requirements might might bubble through the system a little bit more. Uh, but not necessarily through the entire system. Um, the uh, the hotspots uh, can in in an in a nicely separated microservices architecture, in an ideal scenario, can oftentimes be isolated to just affect certain parts of the system, but not others. That might be a fine compromise. Um, this is essentially what we're designing this for. This is why there is stylistic consistency between the models. Um, even in a Spring 5 based world, and with uh, Spring 5 um, being available, um, we want you to be able to choose the trade-off. And my expectation is that 90% of uh, Spring 5-based uh, uh, web code is still going to run in a traditional server container environment uh, because it's based on existing code or just because it's the most straightforward trade-off for the requirements at hand. But for the remaining 10%, there are, uh, the, the reactive facilities that we're providing in Spring 5 can be huge enablers. And if the outcome is that some architectures are reactively coded from from A to, to, to C, in, uh, the, where the entire system architecture is reactively based. If you can architect it that way, all the power to you. <laughs> um, but uh, in enterprise integration scenarios, it's unlikely that that's going to be um, the case anytime soon, from, from my perspective. So we, we are very pragmatic about this. We do not uh, intend this as a kind of new way that supersedes the old way. It's a parallel web stack with specific trade-offs. There are lots of things you cannot do anymore. Don't use traditional transactions. Don't expect them to bind more than one uh, processing step. Uh, don't talk to a, a blocking data store API, ideally. Uh, there, there are many things you should not be doing in this world. Um, so the, the, there's a, there's a trade-off involved. They are basically first-class citizens living next to each other, uh, available as options to you. And uh, we hope that for the uh, requirements of 2017 and, and, and onwards, uh, that both of those options uh, have their merit. Um, for the reactive stack, we hope that uh, 
the rest of the ecosystem kind of catches up, that there are more data store drivers appearing, uh, that there's generally a little bit more um, investment into reactive architectures out there, more coverage of reactive architectures out there. Uh, we're doing this a little bit early maybe, from, from a spring perspective at least, uh, but from my perspective we're doing it at the right time. This is the time where those architectures really come together, where many pieces in, in the puzzle come together. Arch Java 2 is currently in its RC phase, for example, some of the data store efforts really getting there. So uh, by early, mid next year, many things will have uh, reached a, a status uh, where, where they really become a feasible option uh, in, in, in practice. So uh, that's something we're really looking for and something that we are also working towards on our end. I hope we're doing our part uh, and I hope it's you, you find uh, those things useful. Um, also, of course, not just the reactive part, but also our JDK 9 story and, uh, and other efforts in Spring 5. So thanks for your attention. If there are any remaining questions, throw them my way. <laughs> So uh, our quick housekeeping slide that we put up every month, um, we have a mailing list, uh, which you can link to off tjog.ca, and very little happens on it other than announcing videos. Uh, we've got meetup.com, which is probably how you all found us and why you're all here. And we have a Slack group, which I think is Angela's, uh, Angela's managing that. So if you want, want to hook up. <laughs> yeah. Um, we do record all of these, um, just the slides and audio, so you can uh, hit our website tjog.ca slash videos and get a link to them there. We have a mailing list for job postings, which is very low traffic and highly moderated. And we now have uh, 1,363 members on our meetup.com group, so they might not all be humans, there might be a few bots or something on there. And I think. We had, we had 70 people RSVP yes for tonight, something like that. I don't think that's... <laughs> 73, yeah. <laughs> so it's about, about a 50% rate, I guess. Um, O'Reilly's given us a discount program, so you can get uh, money off ebooks and print books if you use this code. And uh, you can always find it in our videos, too. And news this month. Um, Java 9 got delayed a little bit more. Uh, they're now targeting July 2017. There's this site called Java 9 Countdown that we referenced last month, but it hasn't been updated. It still says 176 days, but it's wrong now. Um, so they're, they're still working on Project Jigsaw. They're doing some redesign, refactoring. So yeah, the current target is July 2017. So we'll see. Uh, Java 1 happened. Did anybody here go to Java 1? Not a single person? Okay. Um, yeah, none of us did. There was a few announcements there. Um, one of the more interesting things with this new, new program from Oracle called uh, Go.Java, which is an educational um, initiative to try to get more people to get interested in Java. Uh, new people, young people, trying to make it cooler. So this is, this is Java being cool. This is their new website. It's, it's Go.Java, so they've got the gtld.java. <laughs> oh, if you, if you browse around, it's got all of the best like clip art CD-ROM stuff you've ever seen on it. Um, let's see. <laughs> That's going to be him for me. There we go. Um, some information on Java EE eight came out last month. There was a lot of um, concern that Oracle wasn't working on it. Um, I think they're still concerned, but they've announced that they, they are actually working on it, um, that it's not dead, and that they want to reevaluate the scope to make it more releasable and more reflecting the needs of the community, so more cloud features, more container features, things like that they want to make sure it gets in it. And they're trying to limit the scope of EE8 so they can release it within a year and then move on to EE9. So it'll be interesting to see what happens and if the, the velocity at Oracle picks up and if they start committing more to their projects and uh, start communicating more because it's been really quiet. But they've uh, announced that they're still committed, which is 
a good thing. Um, speaking of Oracle commitments, they're um, hoping to spin off NetBeans as an Apache incubation project. So to totally hand off the range of the project to Apache and uh, let the community work on development and the, the whole uh, future of NetBeans. And they've still, Oracle's still saying that they're, they're going to continue to develop on it for now. Um, but we'll see what happens going forward. So it could be interesting. It will, it actually, does anyone use NetBeans? Are there any, any NetBeans users here? You've used it. <laughs> no, no. Oh, that's right. Yes, if you use Visual VM, that's right. That's part of NetBeans. Um, it's, it's got a good UI framework if you need to build an IDE. I, I don't know. Um, there's an interesting uh, article from Brian Getz about uh, value types in Java. So if you're um, a Scala or functional developer, you've heard of this thing. Um, it's a way to create new, new, very simple primitive types that are very efficient. So they're immutable, which means there's a lot less for the compiler to keep track of, a lot less for the runtime to keep track of. Um, and this gives you, like, if you need a, a larger, a wider integer type, like 128-bit integer or something like that. Um, and there's a mechanism to provide hints back into the JVM to offer more efficient implementation of it. So it could actually use it, use a <laughs> system type if you give it the right information. So um, it's quite, quite a long, detailed article and is very technical. But um, this will give us a little bit more parity with functional languages and possibly a lot higher performance. That's kind of an interesting, uh, interesting change. Is there any indication that that's not uh, no, I don't. That's not a Java nine thing. That's like a, a distant future thing, from what I. At best. Yeah. Brian Getz is um, he's good at making things take a while. He, he likes to <laughs> likes to evaluate them very carefully. Well, you, you know, he he was res responsible for the lambda thing, right? So I mean, he spent a lot of time, got it right, and works really well, but it took 10, 10 years or something. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, it'll be interesting. Um, there was yeah, another... Values types are a little bit similar. Yeah, hopefully. <laughs> you can, yeah. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, they have to work it into collections. And, um, so the new Java modularization system in Jigsaw um, changed a few things with the way packages are imported, like when you import a jar. Um, it can't override system things. You can't add stuff to an existing package. Um, and there's, a, there's this JSR 305 that gives uh, not null and nullable annotations. A lot of people use that to provide better annotation to uh, static analysis of code. And a lot of people were having trouble using this under Jigsaw because it was getting blocked by the Java X annotation mod module that was already in there. So they've taken a bunch of things out of the default and given command line switches for them. And hopefully that will give perfect backward compatibility with it. Um, so it was interesting that they're paying attention to this and they're actually getting feedback from developers and it's working out really well. And Mark, Mark Reinhold, responded to a post about it on Stack Overflow, which I thought that was really neat with his little, little they, Oracle read Stack Overflow. It's kind of cool. Um, no Java updates this month. We're still on uh, U101, U102. And that's pretty much all the Java news I've got this month. So I don't know, <laughs> does anybody have any other news? Excitement? Android Studio 2.2 was released two weeks ago. All right. Meaning, uh, Android now supports Java 1.8. Awesome. Assuming you target us. 24, and you don't have any alliance only supporting about 23% of the devices anymore. And, and, <laughs> and rapidly increasing, right? Anything? Yeah, most of it. All right, so we've got our main presentation from uh, Jurgen on Spring 5.0. Yeah, just to get uh, to see what